When we uh, come out of meditation sitting proper, it is almost like stepping out of a very hot shower and jumping into a very, very cold, cold pool of water. If you've ever been to Japan or a spa that actually has such settings where to keep the body so tender, many people jump back and forth, hot, cold, cold, hot, hot, cold. It really sharpens you up. It really makes the awareness really be on point, where there is a sense of relief as well, a sense of relief. Where there isn't that pushing and shoving and pulling like a tug of war. Because that's not the point. The point, the reason why we meditate is to develop a line of communication between ourselves. To leave the junk out. And most of us are carrying a lot of junk. A lot of junk. What happens with undigested food in the gut? It turns toxic. It turns into poison. If it doesn't come out soon enough, it will kill the body. It will poison the body. Guess what? There is this thing called undigested knowledge, information in the mind that many of us carry, undigested. Just like the undigested food in the gut, guess what that does in the mind? It poisons the mind, where the person is under the false understanding that they're on the right path. Meanwhile, they are so far from it. And it's heavy. You think carrying the head is heavy on your shoulders. Carrying a lifetime of collected data, undigested knowledge, especially when it comes to spirituality, anything to do in this case with the Dhamma. It's just asking for trouble. That's one of the reasons why teachers who encourage you to develop Sangvega urgency in your life, in your practice, will always try to get you, to convince you to unload, to empty the bowl, to make room. But many of us are very comfy keeping all that junk inside. And anyone who challenges that, we become very much threatened. That's the dilemma that we have to deal with. Hence, the need, the necessity, the urgency for us to develop a sense of courage. It takes courage to let go, you know? Ask anyone who has been in a toxic relationship. The toxic relationship could be a job. Toxic relationship could be with a partner, a friend, a husband, a wife, a whatever. And see how easy it was for this person to walk away from that toxic relationship. Similarly, we make very little of the importance to walk away from things that are not helping us one bit. Because all that junk that we carry in our head that is not being applied, tested, meaning undigested knowledge, data, no matter where it came from, is just poison, holding you back. That's why Lord Buddha said in the Dhammapada, you don't need to know the suttas. All of it, you don't need to memorize. Little, little bit of the scripture is enough. Something very little.
that's enough. You could become an arahant with that. Go figure. You don't have to know all these suttas and this and that to come to every single Dhamma talk. What can you take with you throughout the week? What can you and apply? It's like learning a new language. You fill up your head with all the vocabulary, all the conjugation rules, all of it. But when it comes time to practice, application, mums the word. You don't know anything. You don't know how to put the words together. You've never applied it. You've never practiced it. Because we think that it's very much like putting in data, 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 reading this, going to this Bhante, going to this Saida, going to this Ajahn's talk. I'm going to become an Arahant. No, you're not. Even a little bit. Take it with you throughout the day. See, apply. And whatever is inapplicable, guess what? It was a waste of time. You get it out. When I was a layman, I used to have many kinds of seasonings in my kitchen cabinets. I used to cook a lot. So I would buy these seasonings, this type of ingredient, this legume, this type of grains, this and that. And because I, for some reason, had not used it after a certain while, and I would look at the expiration date, and I was like, ooh, it's past its due date. I would toss it out. And guess what? Next time I wouldn't even bother to buy any. Because for all that time that it was sitting in the cabinet, I never used it. Chances are I'm not going to use it. It's not an essential ingredient. Okay. That's one example of taking something for the sake of using it. And that is what legitimizes this thing called knowledge. Knowledge has to prove itself to be of worth, to be worth something. Not because it's some knowledge, it's like zeros and ones, some data. No, it has to be proving its worth. It's like the people that you have in your life. If you're a very intelligent person, you will only have in your life those individuals who are actually enhancing the quality of your life, not sucking the life out of you. Right? We know that. And if you have those people who are like vampires, emotional vampires, guess what? We slowly, slowly disengage ourselves from them. Ah, that same principle applies to knowledge. So I don't care where it comes from. Yeah, but this Bhante said so, so I have to memorize all those things, or this Ajahn said so, or this whatever. Have you applied it? I tried. Did it work? No. Drop it then. Drop it. You don't have time to waste. Take something that is useful. That's it. And if you don't know that it is useful, then it means you haven't applied it. Before you go ahead and collect more information, more so-called knowledge from this teacher and that teacher and this teacher, use the ones that you already have. Before you go ahead and subscribe to new groups, new teachers, new this, new that. Why? Do you have that much time? Really? So make your life count. And that is what I would like to encourage you to have in your heart that attitude of making your life count when you are approaching this very <laughs> misunderstood, misquoted sutta, which is the Kesa Putta Kalama, in other words, many people know of Kalama Sutta. Everybody likes to quote it. Everybody likes, yes, as it says in the Kalama Sutta. Everybody talks about it. How do we understand it? Do we? Unfortunately, many, many uh, individuals, many so-called teachers, many today's so-called uh, Buddhist empiricists, 
People who look at things empirically. Empirically has to do with the body, with the, with the senses, with the touch, with the ways that you can observe. Empirically valid, evidence-based. That's another thing which nowadays many people talk about, evidence-based. Well, what kind of evidence are we talking about? Most people don't have a clue. It's just we toss these terms around, left and right, and makes our statements almost seem like it's genuinely valid, but often they're not. So similarly, when people start quoting Kalama Sutta, many people just bow down and say, oh, it's the Kalama Sutta, so whatever he's saying or she's saying must be valid. Well, we have to go with probing deeper into understanding what is it that Lord Buddha talked about in this sutta, because oftentimes it is misunderstood. Many people think that this sutta encourages free thinking module. It gives us a free license, carte blanche, to go ahead and go ahead and question everything. In fact, go ahead and question the Dhamma itself. Many people have said that. Question even the teachings that Lord Buddha gave, toiled over, exhausted himself to death for 45 years, simply because it doesn't match your level of experiencing it. Well, what if the person is mediocre? Does that mean that the Dhamma is mediocre? So, we have to be understanding what we mean by free thinking, even. Many people have equated the Dhamma with science. There is some validity, some. Notice the dis distance between my thumb and index finger. Some. Because science does not have yet the tools to measure most of what we talk about, what we see and understand and experience through the Dhamma. So we have to be careful. Now as far as empirical evidence or um, things that you can use with these, uh, in, the, in the West, in science, we use the five senses, typically the eyes. Like when you go into the laboratory, you do experimentation, you have to do, if you follow the scientific method proper, you must be collecting data through observation. Usually the observation involves the eyesight. There's other methods too, like smelling, if you're doing chemistry, etc., etc. But usually, it's the eye. So you're using basically the five senses. You're using the body. Hence the empirical evidence, they say. It's undeniable. Well, even that, philosophers even, have proven that could be flawed. Right? Even with quantum mechanics. That completely changed, turned the table over Newtonian physics, for example. Even Einsteinian physics. Many people worship Einstein and his theories of general and special theory of relativity. But actually, it is not, it does not go in line with what was discovered and keeps on being discovered with quantum theory, physics. So we like to take snippets of this and that and this and that and construct a new paradigm for ourselves and say, this is sacrosanct. This is my world. This is my understanding of the world and it is untouchable. Well, guess what we just constructed? Views. Ditti. What Lord Buddha called micha ditti. Wrong views. Because basically I am saying, whatever can go through my little brain, that is what I'm accepting as valid reality. So you had all this going on, and Lord Buddha approaches the Kalamas. In fact, they approach him because they had heard about him. So, uh, when knowledge is kept for its own sake, seen of, uh, to be of value simply because it is presented as such, then it becomes a major hurdle. In fact, we have a term for it. We call it Sangyojana. Do you remember from a few weeks ago? In Buddhism, in the Dhamma, we have a term, fetters. And there's ten fetters. Right? In fact, even in the asavas, 
many people have also listed Dityasava, which is the asava, or the mental contaminant of the views, opinions. It doesn't match what I think, what I believe, what my teachers have taught me. That is the dilemma that the Kalamas were dealing with, partly. They were struggling, trying to understand what is what. So this sutta, the Kalama Sutta, is often misrepresented, misinterpreted by many of the secular Buddhists today. And I've many times mentioned how it's an oxymoron, the term. Secular Buddhist doesn't match. You're either Buddhist or you're secular. You can't have both being together. Because when we say Buddhist, we have to include the entire teachings, which includes Sadha, which includes the doctrine in its fullness. We cannot go around cherry picking. Take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, uh, yes, some of that, not all of In fact, let's forget about all that section of the teachings because it doesn't match our paradigm. And that's what today people are doing. They are window shopping or making a salad. As they choose, based on likes and dislikes. And that's why we go ahead shopping for teachers. Familiar? Sounds familiar? I like this teacher over there because, oh, this happened to me years ago when I was uh, still a layman. I have been giving Dhamma talks for many years, in fact, over two decades, but not, well, when was it, six, seven years ago? Uh, a supporter, a dayaka at a temple where, in Los Angeles where he was giving a Dhamma talk approached me and said, mm, and he was trying to be cordial and nice. He was a, he's a lovely gentleman, uh, older gentleman. He said, um, is there a way that you can make the Dhamma talks a little bit more entertaining? I had eyebrows and my, one of my eyebrows, I'm doing it now but you can't see, went up. And I said, I'm sorry. Could you say it again? Like, what, what, what do you mean, more entertaining? And he said, I'm not going to name the name, but probably you will know, uh, this Ajahn is so entertaining. He tells jokes, he's this, he's, he's a very famous Ajahn, you know. Australia, remember? <laughs> so I said, you want me to talk about my travel itineraries? How I'm stuck at airports and how I'm sitting down and sipping tea with presidents of countries. How I'm basically behaving like modern day Buddhist Osho or Rajneesh. Is that what you want me to do? Yeah, but he's, he's so funny. He tells jokes in a Dhamma talk. So he, it would be more entertaining because when you talk, when you give a Dhamma talk, you're so serious. And I said, what do you mean so serious? Well, you're giving discipline, like you're giving principles, you're lining out, you're all of, like you're delineating this teaching and why the Buddha said this, why it is useful. You're giving stories, you're giving stories from the suttas, but it's kind of serious. And I said, is suffering serious for you or not? But before you answer that, I ask, I ask you this question. Was Lord Buddha telling jokes? Was he an entertainer, according to your standard? Like that teacher, like that Ajahn or something. He knew where I was going. He changed the subject. He kind of felt embarrassed and he walked away. He knew I wasn't going to budge. Our teacher is Lord Buddha. Lord Buddha was not an entertainer. He wasn't a jokester. Was he serious? Depends. Depends on the context. 
But he was alive. He was alive. He still is alive. When you see, when you understand and relate that, correlate that with you, the very fabric of your life. You put that into the DNA of your life. You make it relevant to your life. Suddenly, everything that Lord Buddha said is alive. It matters. You don't need to be entertained. And that's another thing that the Kalamas were dealing with. They were mesmerized by this teacher and that teacher. And they were struggling because after the teacher walked away or the teachers walked away, because um, Kesaputta was where the Kalamas lived, the people of Kalama. And they were living near the edge of a forest which looked towards the Himalayas. So when the yogis or the teachers would come out or down from the Himalayas or out of the forest, they would make a pit stop. They would stop by the Kesaputta village or town where they were. So that's where they would get their food and this and that. And that's an opportunity for the teacher to present his teachings. And that's what they were exposed to. So they were exposed to this teacher, that teacher. Oh, look how beautifully that teacher is so charming. He's saying so many lovely things. Oh, this teacher is so logical, reasonable. So people were deducing. They were coming up with their own interpretation. Yeah, see? And they would intellectually become very attracted. See, so many times when we talk about sensuality, we just think about the body. Sexuality, sensuality. So we think of them as the same. No. <laughs> No, there's this other tiny little but very important part of your experiencing life that you neglected to consider in that case, which is your mind. We are mostly turned on sensually, if you will, to use more of a colloquial term, turned on by thoughts, concepts, perceptions, things that we dwell on. So when a person goes and listens to a Dhamma talk or a teaching or reads a book by someone and their ideas kind of make what resonate with yours, suddenly you feel like, yes, yes, that's what I thought all the time. I love this teacher. That's another trap. And that's another problem that the Kalamas were dealing with. I find this sutta to be extremely human. I don't see 2,600 years difference between us. From our contemporary time then, uh, theirs. I see, I see such a relevance. Like we could now be with the Kalama sitting there about to listen to Lord Buddha talk. Because of their concerns are so human. So relatable, we call it in phys uh, psychotherapy in psychology circles. Relatable. Understand it. So when we're going through the sutta, I caution you not to look at this, therefore, at this discourse as a way for you to reject. Reject uh, the sadha or faith or the doctrine itself. This is not an invitation for the person to reject. Simply because you cannot test it. Some people say, oh, you have faith. You have faith in the Buddha or the Dhamma. I don't, okay? I don't. So I have to experiment. I have to investigate. That's what the Buddha said in the Kalama Sutta. So basically they completely shunned, pushed away, minimized in importance the role of sadha. And I'm just picking up one. One very important ingredient in the Dhamma. Sadha. Or the doctrine. Some teachers, including monks, monks, have shunned the principle or the teaching on the devas that Lord Buddha spent so much time explaining. Because they want to, these teachers want to be accepted by the secular society that we live in. And we have to be very cautious of that. Remember, I was uh, whimsically talking about an experience I had earlier about, uh, you know, saying to this older gentleman that I'm not an entertainer. 
Well, what is that? Why would a teacher want to become suddenly an entertainer? Acceptance. Acceptance. Not much has changed for the person since they were teenagers in junior high school or in high school. If you've ever gone through high school, you know during those years of puberty, you're dying for acceptance, to be part of this clique, that group. That oftentimes do not leave the person. When I used to do therapy with individuals, they would come and I would say, to their amazement, I would say, do you realize that most human beings, most of us, have not matured beyond the age of 7 to 12 years old emotionally? So you might be the CEO of the biggest Fortune 500 company in the world, but emotionally you might be an 11-year-old. That's why when someone says something, cross to you in a board meeting, you go, I'm going to fire you. What happened? Did we even consider where this person was coming from? So all these things were going on. Oftentimes the reason why we accept the teaching is actually coming from a place of emotional attachment. What does this person do emotionally to me? Oh, he smiles a lot. Oh, I like him or her. Is that it? That's the criteria for Dhamma, for knowledge? Really? Earlier I was mentioning to a student, and there are teachers who pass around attainments <laughs> titles of attainments like candy. Oh, you're a Sotapanna. Oh, you're a Sakadagami. Oh, you're an Anagami. I've seen them. I've, you know. And guess what happens to the students following? Oh, yes. Exponential growth in the number of students. Suddenly, from one year to the next, the teacher has no more 300 students or 10 students around the world, they have 300,000 students. <laughs> Who doesn't want to become a Sotapanna overnight or in a 10-day retreat? Sign me up. So when you are giving out these titles, these things, guess what happens? You make people feel good. Why? Because you also have accepted them. Last week I was asking you if there is, whether there is the presence of urgency in the teaching in whomever, whomever Dhamma talk you're listening to, that if they are truly teaching you Lord Buddha's Dhamma, there must be the quintessential ingredient in every single sentence, every single word in fact, the presence of Sangvega. If it's missing, run. Run. Whatever they're selling, you're not supposed to be buying, as we say in America. Because it's a waste of time and you don't have a lot of time. We don't. We don't have how we don't know how long are you do you know how long you're gonna live? I don't. So what are we wasting our time for and on? Again. When we look at the Kalamas presenting their case to Lord Buddha, I need you to have this, to bear this in mind. They are coming from a very existential position. They have this desire to know, to understand. Is this true? <laughs> Whatever I'm holding on to, is this true? Help me, Gautama. Help me, Master Gautama, Bhante, help me. At least, yes or no? And why no, if it is no? So to me, they are truly intelligent people. And we're going to see how Lord Buddha is going to question them, to see what is the foundation. Is there a benchmark? Is there a starting point, a given? Meaning, what is their relationship to Sila? 
And that's where Lord Buddha always starts from. He's not impressed with your level of knowledge. Because as far as we're concerned, it might be just trash. Junk you've collected. Undigested food from so and so, from teachers. Because most of us have CVs, right? Of, I was with this teacher for this long and he taught me this and this teacher and this teacher. And you can name them. You have lovely memories of each. My question is always, your adherence, worship of this teacher, did it get you to become a Sotapanna? What? No? Ah. Oh. Why are we talking about this then? Our teacher is Lord Buddha. We always have to go to that. So I see again and again teacher worship. That has to stop if we need to understand the Dhamma. So there's this maturity that we see in the Kalamas when they approach Lord Buddha. So I need you to observe that. I need you to pay close attention to. And why is it misunderstood? What is it misunderstood? This sutta. There's a basically one passage, one section, one paragraph in the sutta that people constantly use. And they say, because of this, see, see, Lord Buddha is in inviting us to question everything. So I would like to, um, I have um, uh, summarized um, those things. So basically, uh, they are the ten sources of knowledge that are unreliable. Dasa Kankani uh, uh principles, those ten points that should raise some doubts in the mind instead of being looked at as valid sources of knowledge. And you might actually recognize some of them, either in your life or in things that you have probably come across in your interactions with teachers and things. First he says, Kalamas don't rely on oral tradition. This is not something just at the time of the Buddha. Of course, there was a lot of Brahmanic traditions, Upanishadic traditions, which was very based on uh, oral tradition. Uh, Upanishad, it's actually when you take the, the word and separate the roots, Upa, Upa means also close to. Nishad, it comes from Nisidati, to sit close. Who would sit close? The teacher would be sitting here and the student would be sitting down there. And the teacher would actually be whispering because there was no writing, remember? And they would sit down and they would whisper. Upa Nishad. Upa Nishad. So oral tradition. Then they became written and things like that. But that is the basis. So that's only one of the traditions. Upa Nishad. Brahmanic and stuff. So the same thing we have today. Oh, my teacher. My teacher. This Bhante, this Sayadaw, this Ajahn. You have a lot of Western monks becoming, well, Westerners becoming Buddhists and becoming Buddhist monks. And then you have this incredible infatuation, infatuation with their teachers, teacher worship. And then you look at their Asian counterparts. And by the way, this, these are things that I've never heard any bhikkhu talk about. So if it's shocking, it's, you know, deal with it. But no one's talking about it. That's why I talk about this. Because these were dilemmas for me for years. Why is there this unreasonable, incredibly infantile worship of a teacher? When you look at, let's say, in the same tradition, in the same tradition, same color, robes, of an Asian monk from that tradition, in that culture, they still have respect for the teacher, but they don't have this incredible, over-the-top worship of the teacher. So you have many Western monks going crazy over teacher worship, completely overshooting and forgetting as to what this teacher, if it's really an authentic, true Arahant teacher to begin with, let's presume they are, whose student was he to begin with? Lord Buddha. 
So our teacher is Lord Buddha. In fact, the teaching is the teacher. Ultimately, we have to even let go of this, you know, the Buddha Gautama. We take the Dhamma and Vinaya until it becomes one and the same. You become your own teacher. So, so many times we see this infantile worship. And many, much of it comes from oral tradition now. So they have these stories, yes, the Ajahn used to say this, yes, yes. And now they teach the other students who never knew, actually they were not even born when the teacher died. Now they're grown up and now they are monks. So now they're hearing, so it's becoming almost like an indoctrination, oral tradition. Nobody's penetrating with insight. So oral tradition then is being taken as a valid source of knowledge. And Lord Buddha is saying, don't rely on that. That's stupid. That's what Lord Buddha is saying. So I wouldn't want you to think that oral tradition existed 2,600 years ago or in India. No, you're seeing it today. Many, many monasteries in the world were in this tradition, Theravada. Just saying. Second, he says, don't rely on lineage like transmuted. Or, you know, like, uh, you see this in the Mahayana. Transmission. In Japanese it's called Kensho, like uh, something like that, where it's like, they transmit, they transmit the lineage. In fact, if you go down in the lineage of patriarchs, they call Mahakasapa, Venerable Mahakasapa, they took him on and they came up with the story. In the Zen tradition you see this very clearly where apparently, it never happened by the way, we don't see this at all in the 84,000 teachings. Nowhere in the suttas have I come across this. But the Mahayana invented it. So they have Venerable Mahakasapa uh, looking at Lord Buddha, and Lord Buddha at that moment is holding up a lotus or a flower. And Venerable Mahakasapa understands, they say, and there was that transmission, special. In essence, mystical. In essence, secret. And Lord Buddha taught like this. Palms open. Not with one hand behind his back or two. He taught. No esoteric teaching. No mystical teaching. Everything was wide open. Another wrong view. So we have to be uh, very uh, scrutinizing and not fall into the camp of, well, we have to integrate. Well, you keep integrating and one thing is going to happen for sure. You're going to kill the teachings, the authentic teachings, whatever is left of it, is going to be dying at our hands. If we don't say something, at least for ourselves, to know it. Because these things were happening at the time of the Kalamas. So, um, third, don't rely on what you have heard being spoken about someone else. They're very close to what I was saying earlier. Yes, the teacher is like this. You should go and listen to him. He's amazing. Why? Well, many people have said that. Have emailed me. Go, oh, you should listen to this teacher. Okay, benefit of a doubt. If I have time and the curiosity, I will go. You learn, you know, you have to be open. You shouldn't be like a closed box. You have to have the windows open. If it's breezy. But when there's smoke and nastiness, you close the windows. And then you see that, it's like, what are they talking about? Everybody's copying each other. Everybody's being mesmerized, emotionally connected. There's no wisdom. Remember, this is a wisdom path. Through and through. Not sometimes. No. Through and through. It's like the beads that are held together with a string. It goes straight through the bead. The string. That's how it holds it. Next he says, don't rely on the text authority that you hold as sacred. Many monks worship the Tripitaka. 
One of the first talks I gave, actually the second talk I gave here at the BMV when I came a few months ago, was on the Tipitaka as to how the suttas are organized. Some people were shocked when I said, well, actually, at the end of the talk, <laughs> some people were shocked because I said, actually, it's supposed to be Dvipitaka. Dvi. Abhidhamma came about 300 years later. Didn't exist. In the first council, second council, it wasn't there. Some people worship the Visuddhimagga by Venerable Buddha Gosha. They consider it, I've heard this from actual Theravada monk who teach meditation. Monks who teach meditation. They call the Visuddhimagga the Bible of meditation. So that is going by just worshiping the text. There are some suttas that don't belong in the suttas, in the Nikayas, because people injected them in based on what they were thinking like, to validate what their concepts were. After all, the Mahayanists learned it from the early Theravadins, the trick of injecting, putting in suttas where they never happened. <laughs> it didn't happen in a vacuum, you know. So, text authority should not be relied upon simply because of that. Same thing with logic or reason. Many people think that it is the most reasonable religion, the Dhamma, Theravada teachings. There is reason. Yes, you need logic, but when Lord Buddha teaches, he doesn't negate, negate logic. Logic has a role in it, a role. But it can only go so far. It's like you using a ECG or EKG machine to measure a person's vitals or uh, the whole whole assess the person's health. Well, the ECG, electrocardiogram, for those of you who don't know the term, it's only going to reflect one type of an assessment, the beat the heart, how well is it beating, is there enough oxygen coming in, this and that, that's going to take another series, battery of tests. X-ray, the same thing. So if you need to do a whole slew of tests, you need a whole slew of different types of assessment tools and measurements. But this is just, we're talking about the body. And that, all those tests are not even complete. So we need to be using logic as simply with, you know, with a grain of salt, as they say, or a bucket in this case. Next, don't just rely on mere inference. What's gathered through speculation, deduction, deducing, yes, it must be this that the Lord Buddha meant. We have entire schools of Dhamma, the schools of teachings based on such speculations. Lord Buddha is saying, don't. Again, Lord Buddha is not talking to what you would recognize as Buddhists. There weren't such people uh, at the time. So these are people who were dealing with whatever they were seeing, but whatever they were seeing and experiencing were no different than what we are seeing today in Buddhist circles. So that we owe to the human nature of things, how we are as people. We screw things up. We take something beautiful, we will smudge it. We will add our own layers of ignorance to that. So if we use the Kalama Sutta, let's use it to unlayer all that gunk out. Like removing, what was it? Not glaucoma, but the things, the, um, what was it? Hmm? Cataract, yes, remove that from the eyesight. Uh, don't rely on seemingly convincing reason thoughts or thought, but which nevertheless is this deceptive and false. Rhetoric is an, an, a very powerful tool in the hands of politicians around the world. Lawyers have to know rhetoric to win cases. I used to think that lawyers are actually defenders of the truth. <laughs> Yes, I was that naive. 
until I realized I was reading some books and, and then just no, they firmly believe that the case is won, not because of the truth and who proves it. The argument, rhetoric. How convincing can you be? Some years ago, the President of the United States, Bill Clinton, actually had a, I think it's recorded on YouTube, I, I heard him in a testimony when he was being accused of some things inappropriate. I, my jaw dropped when I heard him, and he's a lawyer, and you can't be a you know, politician without being a lawyer because you need to understand the language of deception <laughs> because that's how you communicate. So simply because something sounds reasonable, <laughs> it can very well be just false and deceptive. So don't just go with reason because your reason could actually be completely false, but convincing. So uh, next is don't just accept a position or view after merely considering it within yourself where intellectually it makes sense to me. That's another thing. Don't accept a teacher simply because you're impressed by their ability or charm. I've said enough about that. Don't accept a teacher simply because of the position that this teacher, Bhante or Ajahn or Sayadaw, this holy man whom we call our teacher, therefore he must be respected. Because he must be. Look at us, sitting all around him, everybody's bowing down, doing Anjali. So he must be respectable. Yeah, let's follow along, let's follow everyone else. The herd mentality, or the mob mentality, which we have a lot of this in this world today. So this, these are some of the things that I wanted to share with you before, uh, because a lot of it is actually tinged and colored by our own expectations and especially the projections. What the teacher is supposed to be, really. Having nothing to do with the reality of who the teacher is. Once I was in a retreat and the teacher behaved inappropriately, where he yelled at a student who was simply asking a very legitimate question. He wasn't being argumentative, because I don't care for argumentative comments or this, where you, a person gets up and argues with a person. I didn't like it even in academia when I was a student. Then I was a university teacher. I didn't care for that as a professor. There needs to be the desire to learn, not argue. So this person was not arguing. But the teacher couldn't get out of the question. <laughs> So he went into loops, hoops, turns, circles, and then finally turned it on the, stu on the student who was asking a very legitimate question. And he yelled at the person. And I was like, whoa. So I wanted to avoid that. I wanted to delete that from my memory. But another person in the room later on, we were, I was just participating in that retreat. It was in Indonesia. And he said, that didn't sit well with me. What do you think about that behavior? He had more courage than I. Because I started to immediately cover up for the teacher. I started to make excuses for the teacher. I said, yes, that's not right, but it's his personality. You got to admit, he's like that. He's very rough around the edges, we say. But yeah, he said, I get that, but he's a monk, he's a Buddhist monk, he's not supposed to be. Plus, the person was just respectfully asking a question. That has stayed with me for many years. Because I saw similar reactions, similar behaviors in the teacher after that. And then I realized that I cannot cover for him anymore in my head, in my heart. And I had to confront the teacher himself at one point. And that was very interesting. <laughs> so, we have to be very careful about our expectations of the teacher being, oh, he or she must be spiritually evolved. So, he must be an arahant. I've had students, even here in Malaysia, after I came here, mentioning about this Ajahn or that teacher, that side, oh, he's an arahant. 
well, that's a big statement to make, but what's your evidence? How do you know? Did he, did he show you your, uh, his, his certificate? Oftentimes, it's the students who blindly go around spreading such nasty, poisonous rumors to spread the fame of the unearned respect of this person, to bring it in. And that is causing so much damage. If you notice, I said, is causing so much damage to the sasana, because we have way too many of them. Every monk who becomes famous, immediately we presume that he at least has to be a Sakadagamin or a Sotapanna. No, no, no. If he's a 10 years a monk, an Ajahn or something like that, or Saida, he definitely must be an Arahant. How do we know? And why do we care? Why don't you go become one? Why don't you go become an Arahant yourself? People worship. And that's very stupid. So Lord Buddha is trying to tell the Kalamas, don't be stupid. <laughs> so let's begin. This is the, I know I gave a very long introduction, but it's deserving of it. So I'm going to go as quickly as possible through it because it is a beautiful sutta. It's a very important sutta. Unfortunately, it is misquoted too often. That's why I had to go you know, and, and elaborate on those factors. So, it's from the Anguttara Nikaya, Book of the Threes, uh, Sutta number 65, Kesa Puttiya or Kalama Sutta, Discourse to the Kalamas. This is uh, my translation of it. Okay, so here we begin. This is what I have personally heard. At one time, the Blessed One was touring the country of Kosala with a large Sangha of bhikkhus as he entered the township of Kesaputta of the Kalamas. Then the Kalamas of Kesaputta heard that the good recluse Gautama, son of the Sakyan clan, had gone forth from the home life into homelessness and, not, uh, and now has entered their city of Venagapura. Further, they heard how such a good uh, praise has spread about the Blessed One, Gautama, that the Blessed One is an Arahant, perfectly awakened, accomplished, and endowed with true knowledge and conduct. Basically, this is the uh, Itipiso Bhagava Arahant, that portion that we have. So we see this so many times in the suttas being repeated. The qualities of Gautama, the Buddha, is being recited by the Kalamas, the renown. Uh, in accomplished and endowed in true knowledge and conduct, well gone, nor of the worlds, the incomparable discipliner of those to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed, having realized by himself with direct knowledge in this world together with gods and humans, maras, brahmas, as well as the community of recluses and brahmins. He teaches the Dhamma that is good in its beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end full of the right meaning and phrasing, clearly revealing thus the spiritual life that is utterly perfect and pure. It is good indeed to be able to see such arahants. Then the Kalamas of Kesaputta approached the Blessed One, where some paid homage to him and sat down to one side. Some exchanged friendly greetings and sat down to one side. Some extended their clasped hands towards the Blessed One and sat down to one side. Some announced their name and clan and sat down to one side, while still others silently sat down to one side. All of this means that not everyone had the same level of respect or appreciation of Lord Buddha. Some were just being cordial. Some were really devout. Some were really impressed. So you're seeing different gradation or spectrum of audience acceptability, shall we say. Then Vachagutta, uh, Vachagutta is a, a last name of a, because we see this Vachagutta last name or clan name in different places. It's not the same person. Somebody who belongs to that same clan. A Venagapura of that town said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, some recluses and Brahmins who come passing through our town of Kesaputta explain their own views but while at the same time denigrating, denouncing, and disparaging the views of others. 
which they make seem to be useless. So they're putting down other people's teachings while raising theirs up. Uh, then other recluses and Brahmins passing through our town of Kesaputta, they too explain their own views, but while at the same time denigrating, denouncing, and disparaging the views of others, which they make seem to be useless at best. Venerable Sir, this has been a source of confusion and doubt for us in Kesaputta, as we find ourselves perplexed and unsure as to which recluse speaks the truth and which one speaks the untruth. I don't know of many people today who have the same level of courage and honesty as the Kalamas did. Because it takes a level of humility, a special, superlative level of humility, to come forward and pretty much put what you believe in on the chopping board, as it were, to question it. You're coming to this teacher and you're bringing along with you all that you've heard and saying, is this true? That requires a tremendous level of trust, honesty, and courage. How many of you, of you, of us, have that today? So many of us are actually attached, tied at the umbilical, if you will, to what we had learned from our teacher. Bhante so-and-so taught me this. Okay, where did that get you? Are you not a hunt yet? No? Okay, so why are we still there? Is it useful? That's what they're saying. They have the audacity. It's beautiful to have this. It's encouraging for us that people can be that. And because they're also coming forward and saying, I'm confused. How many of us can actually say that? How many of us can actually honestly stand up, look in the mirror and say, you know what, I am confused. No, we always are certain. <laughs> Even if we're, you know, if our hair is on fire. We're never going to admit to someone, hey, I'm sorry, I'm confused. Could you help me? There's arrogance. Today we have such tremendous pride, especially when it comes to the Dhamma. Ah, I know this, I know the Paticca Samuppada. Really? Are you awakened? That's the only way you can really know Paticca Samuppada. Don't list me the Paticca Samuppada links, please. Don't waste my time. Who cares? Who cares? So they're confused. I find that extremely courageous. We can't do that today. Everybody's an expert. Everybody's an expert. Well, if everybody's an expert, then you're going to have a big circus. Why? Because everybody's dumb, if everybody's an expert. That's how fools, that's how countries, that's how dynasties are destroyed. But here we see a humility. We want to have so many teachers. We want to hoard teachers and teachings. Why? Why? If you're making a dish and you put in every spice in the cabinet in there, you ruin the dish. We know that. It's inedible anymore. You cannot touch that. You throw it into the trash can. That is what your mind has become. You don't need this many teachers. <laughs> if you're the teaching, any of these teachings, if the Dhamma is any, in any way valid, then it must prove itself. Remember, applicability? One part of it is enough, really. <laughs> You don't need to have a whole selection of knives in order for you to chop a tomato. You just need one single sharp knife. And the Dhamma is very sharp, if you know how to use it. So, 
Let us not invade or intrude upon the reality that we're experiencing. Intrude upon it, invade it with our views of what we think it should be. Ditti is poison. And there's a lot of poison in our mind. We need to remove that if we want to understand the Dhamma. Avidya is at the root, you know. And here's Lord Buddha's response. He says, Kalamas, given what you have described, it is understandable for you to become confused, perplexed, and unsure as to which recluse speaks the truth and which one speaks the untruth. Come, Kalamas, do not accept the teaching simply on account of it being disseminated through oral tradition. So here is what I earlier summarized, or you know, concluded in a very short way. Or by lineage of teaching, or by hearsay, by scriptures, by logical reasoning alone, by inferential reasoning alone, or on the grounds of authority, or by the charisma or apparent competence of the speaker, or by their words, while thinking, I have to follow such a teacher because they are my guru. We become confused when we hold on to views. That has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? We become confused when we hold on to our views. So check. Am I holding on to my views? Remember last week I mentioned from Pachalaya Manasutta when Lord Buddha turns to Venerable Mahamogala and says, Sabbe Dhamma Nalang Abhinivesaya. Nothing is worth clinging to, including the Dhamma. That's how uh, Venerable Sariputta became an Arahant, you know. He was fanning at an, another occasion, two, uh, one week later, Venerable Mahamud Gallana became an Arahant in one week. Venerable Sariputta in two. He was kind of slow, but actually not. He really had to go deeper because he had to become the general of the Dhamma. He had to be second only to the Buddha in wisdom. That's why he strived. He went into the deep end. So Venerable Sariputta is fanning Lord Buddha in the summer heat of India. Terrible heat. And Lord Buddha is giving a talk to this Upasaka, who's a relative of his, of, I think, Venerable Sariputta. And... Uh, and Venerable Sariputta, for a moment, pulls himself back and looks at the interaction between a teacher and a student, and he says, Oh my! The king of the Dhamma, Lord Buddha himself, is not attached to the Dhamma itself. He's not even attached to it. He is the Dhamma, but he's, no, he's not attached to it. And that creates such a shock for Venerable Sariputta that immediately his last fetters drop, and he becomes an arahant. He's shocked with the simplicity of it. Lord Buddha was not attached to the Dhamma. So we see a demonstration of that a week after him telling that same principle to Venerable Mahamu Gallana. So confusion comes from when we hold on to our views, opinions of things, how they're supposed to be. Hence, our views are the greatest obstacles on the path. If you know, want to know the, the if you want to know what's what's stopping you, don't look at someone else. Look at your own views because they're the only ones that are stopping you. The views that you have about yourself, who you are what level you're supposed to be on, but you're not, self-judgment, criticism, all these things are views. Because after all, views are themselves life negators. They negate life. They cancel out life. They deprive us of life, of the juiciness of life, of the freshness of life freshness of life. However, Kalamas, when you ponder and know for yourselves by saying, these thoughts are unwholesome, these thoughts are blameworthy, these thoughts are reproved by those considered wise, 
excuse me, these thoughts undertaken and accomplished are not conducive to our welfare and they bring about more suffering, then, Kalamas, you should abandon those thoughts. So if you see some thoughts that are unwholesome and they bring you suffering, don't entertain them, he says. Simple. Simple. What do you think, Kalamas, is the arising of greed in a person, Loba, conducive for his benefit or ruin, destruction? Which one? Is it, does it bring growth or ruin? Venerable Sir, it is not for his welfare, it is for his ruin. Ah, Kalamas, a greedy person with a mind obsessed with greed destroys living things, takes what is not given, covets, and then goes to others wise, tells lies, and encourages others to do the same. Now, do such actions conduce to his ruin and suffering for a long time? Yes, Venerable Sir. Okay, so that means that they have an understanding of sila, virtue. This is where Lord Buddha is establishing, okay, what is the level of these people's virtue, their understanding. Today you go to America, United States, and parts of the Western world, not just the Western world, but other places too, but primarily. Let me just talk about the United States because, you know, I'm from there and I'm shocked to find the level of lack in virtue that I'm seeing in people's lives. In fact, it is being celebrated. Ethics is going out the window more and more every day. Human values, family values are out the door. And in fact, if you are promoting healthy living in that fashion, people are shunning you. They're labeling you. I have students who contact me from different parts of the world and they're shocked. And they're trying to understand what is the Buddhist position on this, on that topic and that topic. That tells me today we're living in very um, non-virtuous times. Let me just say that. And that also reflects on the quality of health and uh, unwell state of the planet as such. Because in different parts of the suttas, in Anguttara Nikaya for one, different places, you see Lord Buddha talking specifically about the welfare of the planet, the safety, even the lifespan of people being directly connected with the level of sila on the planet. So collectively, there's a lot of people on the planet who actually have very little sila. In fact, in their past lives, they did not care much about sila, and that's why they are born at this time period. All these things come together, coalesce, creating the conditions for the state of affairs that we see around us. So there's no point in blaming one person or one group of people. It's cumulative. That's the law of Kamma. So here is said, testing to see what is their position on Kamma, on action, on virtue, sila. What do you think, Kalamas, is the arising of anger in a person conducive for his benefit or ruin? Venerable Sir, it is not for his welfare, it is for his ruin. Kalamas, an angry person with a mind obsessed with anger, destroys living things, takes what is not given, covets, and then goes to others' wives, tells lies, and encourages others to do the same. Now, do such actions conduce to his ruin and suffering for a long time? Yes, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Kalamas? Is the arising of delusion in a person conducive for his benefit or ruin? So if you notice, he's talking about the kilesias, the defilements. So now we're getting into the delusion, which is moha. Venerable, it is not uh, for his welfare, it is for his ruin. Kalamas, a deluded person with a mind drenched in ignorance, destroys living things, takes what is not given, covets and then goes to others' wives, tells lies, and encourages others to do the same. Now, do such actions conduce to his ruin and suffering for a long time? Yes, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Kalamas? Are such thoughts and actions wholesome or unwholesome? Venerable Sir, they are unwholesome. Unwholesome in English, in Pali it is akusala. Wholesome is kusala. 
if, for those of you who don't know. Are they blameworthy or blameless? Venerable Sir, they are blameworthy to be blamed. Are they reproved or praised by the wise? Venerable Sir, they are reproved by the wise. They're chastised. They're criticized. And how do you understand it that when such actions are undertaken and committed, do they conduce to evil and suffering or not? Venerable Sir, as we understand it, when such actions are undertaken and committed, they conduce to evil and suffering. So he's talking about very basic level Dhamma. He didn't say anything. He's using their own lives as an exhibit, as, as an example, as a resource of understanding, as a form of knowledge, experiential knowledge. The person knows, if I do this, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to break the law. I'm going to, they're going to be arresting me, cut off my hands if I steal, or kill me if I, you know, kill someone else. So these are very concrete examples. So yeah. <clears throat> so from these answers, then we know that they lived a virtuous life. The Kalamas, they were highly intelligent people. In this way, Kalamas, as we have stated, come, uh, uh, yeah, he says, come, Kalamas, do not accept the teaching simply on account of it being disseminated through oral tradition by lineage of teaching. As we have said, he says, Lord Buddha. So he repeats, because I'm trying to save my voice. <laughs> He's repeating what I, uh, he said earlier. Uh, when you ponder and know for yourselves by saying these thoughts are unwholesome, these thoughts are blameworthy, these thoughts are reproved by those considered to be wise, these thoughts undertaken and accomplished are not conducive to our welfare, and they bring about more suffering, then, Kalamas, you should abandon those thoughts. So, he's, he's, he's reaffirming that position. Um, so he repeats this again and again about oral traditions, scriptures, hearsay, lineage, authority, etc. Um, okay, so however, Kalamas, when you ponder and know for yourselves by saying these thoughts are wholesome, these thoughts, so now he's saying when you ponder, so you know the ones that are blameworthy, what about the blameless thoughts? Okay, we have another sutta uh, in the Dveda Vitaka Sutta and the Majjhima Nikaya, Middle Neck Discourses, where Lord Buddha, before he became an Arahant, when he was still struggling as a yogi, he saw, he looked at his own thoughts. He saw that there's two kinds of thoughts. Thoughts that are unwholesome and thoughts that are wholesome. And he says, from now on, I'm going to pile up the thoughts that are unwholesome into a pile, put them in a group, and I'm going to make another group, another pile of wholesome thoughts. And from now on, I'm only going to be using thoughts that are coming from this pile, the wholesome pile. This is genius. This is incredibly simple, but so beautiful, so applicable. Imagine, can you do that? Recognizing which one is good, wholesome, which one is bad. From now on, just pick from this group. Basically, that is the recipe for becoming an harahat. <laughs> so simple. And he's repeating this to them, in different words, of course. Kalama is a person lacking greed, someone who has alobha, Loba, aloba, greed or non-greed, not overcome by it and with a mind not obsessed by greed, does not destroy living things, does not kill, does not take what is not given, neither covets nor goes to others' wives. He does not tell lies nor encourages others to engage in unwholesome behavior. Now, do such actions conduce to his benefit and happiness for a long time? Yes, Venerable Sir. Okay, so now he's going to the kusala portion. Earlier he was talking the, about the akusala, so he saw they understand what is unwholesome. Now he's seeing if they recognize what is wholesome. So he's establishing from the three trainings, if you remember, sila, samadhi, panya. 
He is establishing the very first, without which there is no growth. You have many, many groups today, even calling themselves Vipassana groups, where there is no sila. And they expect to grow in the Dhamma. It's impossible. Sila is the, imagine the ground upon which the building is going to stand. How can you have the tenth floor without the first, or the second, or third, or fourth, or ninth? Think of the tenth floor as the sati or samadhi portion of the training. It needs to stand on ground level and everything else between itself and the, and the ground. So, uh, what do you think, Kalamas? Is the arising of non-anger in a person conducive for his benefit or ruin? So this is now talking about adosa, person who does not have anger or hatred. Yes, uh, Venerable Sir, it is for his benefit and not for his ruin. Kalama is a person lacking anger, not overcome by it, and with a mind not obsessed by anger, does not destroy living things, does not take what is not given, neither covets nor goes to others' wives. Because before you break a precept, your mind actually gets agitated. Last week we were talking about papanchas. If the mind is agitated, something's wrong. There are the three kileshas. That should be your bell. Check the mind, always. When your heart is racing, when your heart is beating faster, which means your agitated mind is there, there's no tranquility of mind. Every time you're about to break a precept, even if you are convincing yourself that you're not breaking a precept, check, oh heart, hello, are you agitated? Is the mind calm and serene? If it is, you're okay. Check. Check. Don't listen to the mind, the, the logical, argumentative, rhetoric-based mind that's always trying to come up sneakily, slithering its way to convince you of something. While it's going on, Take a quick look into the heart. Is it agitated? If it is, pull back. Pull back and look at the big picture. Lord Buddha is saying it much more eloquently here, obviously, than, than what I'm trying to say, but it's basically the same thing. What do you think, Kalamas? Is the arising of non-delusion in a person conducive for his benefit or ruin? Venerable Sir, it is for his benefit, not for his ruin. This is Amoha the opposite of moha, or delusion. So, what do you think, Alamas? Are such thoughts and actions wholesome or unwholesome? Venable Sir, they are wholesome. Are they blameworthy or blameless? Venable Sir, they are blameless. Anyone who, ha who functions, who behaves, whether thought, speech, or body, using alobha, adosa, amoha, meaning non-greed, non-hatred, and non-delusion. When they're performing these actions based off of that, would their behavior be blameworthy or blameless? They recognize it is blameless, Bhante. Are they reproved by or, 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 uh, or praised by the wise? Venerable Sir, they are praised by the wise. It's not easy to do uh, kusala sometimes, especially in this world, where you have this strong Niagara type of current behind you, pushing you to break your principles. That's why it's okay to stand alone against the world. In fact, if you have the Dhamma in your heart, palpitating, beating healthily, with so much vigor, you cannot help but stand against the world. You have to, because this world belongs to Mara. Your body belongs to Mara. Your eyes belong to Mara. The things your eyes see belong to Mara. Everything belongs to Mara, except what's in your heart. If it is the Dhamma, off limits. Off limits for Mara. 
So to be able to hold your ground, you need to stand against the craziness that's happening in the world. Don't be afraid. That's what Lord Buddha is saying. Is your behavior blameless or blameworthy? That's what Lord Buddha is going after. And how do you understand it that when such actions are undertaken and committed, do they conduce to benefit and happiness or not? Venerable Sir, as we understand it, when such actions are undertaken or, and committed, they conduce to benefit and happiness. In this way, Kalamas, as we have stated, do not accept the teaching simply on account of it being disseminated through oral tradition. So he repeats that formula of the ten points, the false basis of knowledge. So, words don't teach. We often forget that. Words don't teach. Information does not, in essence, teach anything. Many of us are carrying container size information over our heads, <laughs> over these poor necks that we have. <laughs> we drag ourselves throughout life carrying all this nonsense, bundles and bundles of unused, useless. I can't even say unused, it's useless. Because the knowledge, in order for it to be knowledge, it needs to do something to you. It needs to bring happiness to your life. Otherwise, why carry it? Why? What does it do for you? So the meaning behind the words, what we do with that meaning as well, is the key factor. The words themselves mean nothing. They don't teach. There's a thing, I think it's from Zen tradition, where the finger pointing to the moon, they say. Well, the finger is pointing to the moon, or at the moon. It is not the moon. That's what we do, though. We worship the finger. We are just mesmerized by this, by that, carrying the Dhamma over our head. So many people can recite the Four Noble Truths, but when you go asking them, how can you translate that into your normal everyday life? In your struggles, could you see that relationship when you're fighting with your spouse? Do you see the Four Noble Truths? Yeah, but no, Four Noble Truths is actually something else. No. Do you have suffering when you're fighting? Yes. Okay, check. Because you're holding on to something. Second noble truth. Release that, whatever it is you're holding. Boom, you have Niroda. The third noble truth. But how can I release it? How can I maintain that? Chap to see the Eightfold Path. Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, etc., etc. There you go. Now you made the Dhamma relevant for your life, in your life. And you don't memorize. It's like eating the menu when you're starving. Imagine you go to a restaurant and you're starving, and you walk out of the restaurant with all the menus under your belt, under your armpit, and you're just like, yes, <laughs> I've gotten all these meals down. How's your stomach? Is it full? No, it's not. You're carrying the menu, the name of the dish, on a piece of paper. Many of us are carrying the Dhamma in our brain, like that, while we are still hungry. However, Kalamas, when you ponder and know for yourselves by saying these thoughts are wholesome, those thoughts are blameless, these thoughts are praised by those considered wise, these thoughts are undertaken, are accomplished, are conducive to our welfare, and they bring about happiness, then, Kalamas, you should grow such thoughts further and live in harmony with them. So it's not abandoning now, you need to cultivate. Which, by the way, it is reference to the four right efforts. Samavayama. 
we need to first stop the entryway of unwholesome tendencies, actions. We need to stop them from arising. So we need to stop the ones that are ongoing. Close the door. If there are rats coming into your house, I say to people, what's the first thing you need to do? Go after the rats or first close the doors? First, you make sure that the entry points are closed, locked. Second, you go after the rats. Those are the first two parts of the right effort. Next, you cultivate qualities of, that are wholesome, that are not there. And then fourth, you develop those even more. You maintain. It's like learning a new language. You learn the vocabulary, you learn all the rules of conjugating this and that, grammar, and then you have to practice daily. That's the practice, the fourth part. And it becomes natural. So that's what he's encouraging them to do. In this way, Kalamas, the noble disciple who is thus free from covetousness, free from anger, free from delusion, clearly comprehending and aware with mindfulness established, pervades one quarter direction with loving kindness. Ah. So too, the second quarter, the third quarter, the fourth quarter, so above, below, across, in every respect, radiating a mind fully drenched with loving kindness. Metta. Enveloping and growing in all directions, immeasurable and without anger or resentment. Many, many people swear by the Sutta, Kalama, but they never gotten to this point. They never know. They've never considered that the Sutta is also talking about the four Brahma Viharas. Who knew? Imagine. Lord Buddha first established them in Sila. Next, he's taking them straight to the Brahma Viharas. That's how powerful they are. Specifically, the first one that he starts with, Metta. That's why I teach Metta so much. Once you have Sila, remember Sila Samadhi. It's not first Sila, you have to develop it to for perfection and then you start. No, at the same time. That's what Lord Buddha is saying, teaching them. So they're doing the six directions. There's part of the practice where I encourage, I see how the student is developing with metta, I will get the person eventually to do the six directions. Because your development in sending metta, radiating to your spiritual friend has become so honed, so laser-like, you're so able to do it with so much prowess and expertise, you're sharp then you can change the direction. When I used to drive in Los Angeles, in the crazy traffic, in the road rage, in Los Angeles freeways, without people noticing, without knowing, I would be zapping people left and right with metta. As they say, they didn't know what hit them, because they would be getting metta left and right. And I would test. I don't recommend that, but I would test to see the person next to me who's stuck on, in the freeway. And I would just radiate, radiate, and then you look at their face and they're turning around and they look at you and there's a sudden smile, which is such a rarity in Los Angeles, on the freeways, in rush hour traffic. But again, I don't recommend you look for the evidence first. The evidence has to come from your heart. Do you feel extremely joyful when you're radiating it? Are you feeling, when you're generous with your giving of metta? That itself is so powerful. And that's why Lord Buddha is sharing this technique. And he doesn't stop with metta. Next he uh, uh, talks about pervading the same way, um, the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth, etc. with karuna, compassion. Then with mudita, altruistic joy, or sympathetic joy, sometimes people say. And then finally, equanimity. Because these are gradually deepening the experience. 
Because as you practice metta, the mind becomes so calm, so relaxed, so comfortable, that it naturally flows into karuna without you doing anything. It's funny because sometimes students would run in and say, Bhante, uh, I don't know why, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do metta, but it's so hard. I asked him, what, what is your experience? What's, is, is that agitated mind? No, they say, I'm fine. I just feel a lot of compassion though. So what's the problem? But I don't have metta. They're called the four Brahma Viharas for a reason. They're brothers and sisters. It's if you've ever seen Olympic Games, they pass the baton, somebody runs, and they reach out and get past the baton. Think of it like that. So they will switch. And it's a lovely switching. You don't have to do anything. You just watch and observe and enjoy the ride. And the mind, meanwhile, is going deeper and deeper. And suddenly, without you knowing, you might be at work driving or in the kitchen washing something. Suddenly, the mind drops into a powerful state of equanimity. There's like quiet. And you feel guilty because, hey, I'm not in a retreat. I didn't sit for 10 hours. Why am I feeling so solid, so safe? The mind is so equanimous. Guess what? You just dropped into equanimity. But it needs practice with metta. You have to prepare the mind. But you cannot do it when your bowl is full. Empty. Constantly. Make sense? Okay. All right. Further. Okay. In such a way, Kalamas, when this noble disciple's mind is without anger, without covetousness, not soiled, and is pure, he here and now gains four certainties while being alive. Four certainties. Assurances. Here, with the first certainty, he knows that if there is another world, if there are the results of good and evil actions, there is a possibility that I, after death, will be reborn in a good state in heaven. This is his first certainty. If there is no other, another world, if there are no results for good and bad actions, here and now I abide without enmity without having any hatred with anyone, without covetousness. I abide in purity and happiness. This is his second certainty. And consolation. It's comforting to know that, hey, there might be heavens, there might be fine, but even if it's not, in this life right now, I feel so good because I feel protected. I'm not, I haven't done anything to anyone in the recent past. Nobody's coming after me. I didn't kill anyone. I didn't steal from anyone. And I'm okay. And it's good to know. If I die right now, I'm going to die comfortably. So I'm feeling good now, and at the moment of death, I'm going to be comfortable. That's another certainty. That's another sense of consolation. If there is, uh, the evildoer does evil, I do not think of any evil. I have not done any evil, so I will not experience any results of evil. This is his third certainty. Even if the evildoer does not experience the evil consequences of his evil actions, I still see myself residing in peace and purity in both respects. This is his fourth certainty. This is... Lord Buddha talking to the Kalamas who are not yet ready to understand or probe or even have the faith that there is another world. But he's not making it an absolute must for them to believe in another world. He's saying the proof is in the pudding. He's saying you keeping the precepts, sila, being a blameless, living a blameless life is giving you immediate results now. You sleep comfortably. Isn't that a good consolation to have? It's like someone who doesn't have debt. 
Nobody's going to come knocking on your door at night, pulling you out, to, dragging you to jail. That's a good thing. Thus, Kalamas, when the noble disciple's mind is without anger, without covetousness, not soiled and is pure, he here and now gains these four certainties while being alive. So you don't have to wait for your eyes to close for the last time, so you open them up in a different world to see, oh, okay, so the Dhamma was real. That's not Dhamma. That's not what Lord Buddha is teaching. You must taste the fruit of the Dhamma here. Now, at the very least, your mind should not be agitated. The easiest way to do that, keep your sila. Simple. You're not doing it for me, Lord Buddha. You're not doing it for anybody else. For you. It is just so, blessed one. It is just so, O Tathagata. For when the noble disciples mind, this is them talking, addressing Lord Buddha. For when the noble disciple's mind is without anger, without covetousness, not soiled and is pure, he here and now gains four certainties. If there is another world, if there are the results of good and evil actions, there is a possibility that I after. So he, they are repeating what he said. So I'm not going to read that again. And then they say, Magnificent Venerable Sir, Magnificent Venerable Sir, the Blessed One has made the Dhamma clear for us in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been turned upside down, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see. The person is, uh, this is uh, Vachagotta of uh, Venagapura saying, I go to the Blessed One for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. From this day forward, may the Blessed One remember me as a lay disciple who has taken refuge in him from today until the end of life. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. A beautiful, beautiful. Sublime Sutta, I say. This Sutta talks about a lot of things that are very relevant with our living experience. How virtue can have such a powerful impact on our lives. It's not about accumulating knowledge. I've seen that to be one of the unique symptoms of Asia. where people hoard a lot of teachings, hoard a lot of teachers, <laughs> collections of teachers. So I hope this sutta encourages you to kind of slowly back away from such a way of living, because your life is precious. I was mentioning this to another student the other day. When you get closer and closer to your destination, you cannot continue being on several different highways at the same time. It doesn't work. You have to select one after careful study, consideration, making sure that, okay, this, this sounds right to me, to my heart. I'm just going to dedicate, just, and I'm going to try it for some time. If that doesn't work, I'll change to another highway. Do that, but don't try to drag different teachers and then start a war in your brain amongst them. <laughs> and then try to justify who's what. So, here we see the clear mention and instruction of uh, cultivating the four Brahma Viharas, which is a crucial part of your growth. Metta is not something that you do for five minutes at the end of a meditation, like so many places do. It's the other way around. Lord Buddha taught the Brahma Viharas more than other techniques. He taught Metta more than any other technique, including the Anapanasati. I emphasize Metta now in this time period, in this world, in this planet, Trajectory, the way we're going, the, the, the direction we're going is not good. We're becoming very much apathetic, which is the opposite of empathy, having empathy. Now we need the Dhamma more than ever. And we are all breathing, living beings. We have this movement now in the world 
called transhumanism. One of the worst things that we can ever anticipate, but it's coming. And people are promoting it. Even some monks I've seen talking about it. People talk about robots and humans coming together. Oh, it's wonderful. Elon Musk is itching to in inject a chip into the brain. These are facts. No teacher is talking about this. No bhikkhu is talking about this. But it is over our head. It's looming over us. We have to have a position. We have to have an understanding. What is the Dhamma's position about this? Nobody has a clue. Nobody's researching what's being done. The direction. You have scientists or philosophers promoting the idea that, oh, within a hundred years, we're all going to be run by robots, AI. Well, AI is running most of the world now. We know that. But we are not just a... We, don't, we should no longer have this reductionist, materialistic view of life. And some people have actually, even monks, scholarly type monks, have even used this sutta to justify their reductionist, materialist view of the Dhamma. And that is wrong. You are not a machine. People are talking about, oh, you're just a machine, you're just urges and cognition and affect. You have to push down the emotions, you have to lift up the mind. What is that? Lord Buddha never talked about that. Never. But people are making their own dumb interpretations. So we have to be very careful and look at the whole picture as to what time period we're living in. What are some of the wrong views that are dominant and coming and seeping into the Dhamma? It is seeping. And many of us are not prepared. The Buddhist world is not prepared. We're just going with the flow. We need to have a position by going back to look at, well, we have to look at the whole picture. So there's a lot of left brain activity, I call it, linear thinking. The, ref, the left brain looks in parts, in terms of parts. It's expert at that. But it can never know the relationship among the parts. That is the expertise of the right brain, which is the biggest part of the brain. The right brain is what's going to help you to become an arahant, by the way. Because it understands relationships. The right brain does not care about how much accumulated junk you have in your brain. Data. I've had people who interrupt me constantly and say, and throw out these poly words. Yes, it's this, it's that. I say, shut up. Be quiet. Not for my sake. Just be quiet and listen to your mind. Listen to all this nonsense you got going. Understand the relationship of the Dhamma. Is it helping you? So this sutta is a perfect example of that. To understand the relationship that we have with the Dhamma. And is it bringing more joy, happiness into our lives, growth, or not? And if it's not, change it. Change your attitude. I will stop here because my throat is gone. <laughs> I mean my voice. But I have some energy left to address some questions. <laughs> I have a few questions actually. Uh, the All first right. one is uh, about the metta uh, meditation. So uh, according to the method that you taught so far is that uh, you use a happy memory to generate that feeling of metta. Uh, my question is, what happens if that memory doesn't work anymore? Maybe oh. you've used it too many times. <laughs> so the memory dies mm. in a way. So that's my first question. Second question is, uh, you also said that, uh, this is still related to the metta meditation, once you uh, generate that feeling, how do you, you, well you said to enhance it, to promote it, <coughs> I believe those were uh, the words you've used, so how do you actually make that feeling grow once you have it in your body? My last question, I hope you don't mind, uh, is uh, in the Sarakani uh, Sutta, uh, can you explain how come someone like Sarakani, who is a, a person who, who likes to drink, who is a drunk, actually died 
as a Sotapanna. Thank you, Bhante. First question. Uh, yes, because we, we have this thing called anicca. It also relates to the states of mind, the mental objects that come in. And what you're promoting is a mental object, basically. When you're inviting a memory, it's a mental object. And it will change. Uh, if you've read the book, I've given the example. So that's why I highly recommend reading the book entirely. Because that question, I address it repeatedly in the book. Um, and other questions as well. So yes, you can definitely, most certainly use different memories, sensations. It could be from that moment. Sometimes people have said, let me just smile to myself. Boom, that did it for them. So don't hold on to a specific memory all the time. The key thing is to have an uplifted state of mind. Your heart feels light, thanks to the memory, how you're feeling at that moment. You kick your shoes off. Let's say if you're wearing size one size smaller shoes, after the end of the day and you're like kicking off those shoes, how does your feet feel? If they had a mouth, they would go, ah, oh, that gives you an uplifted feeling. You don't have to have a memory. So it could be also physical, somatic experience. Now this relates to the second question you have. You need to maximize that. You need to look at that and feel that in the absence of other intruding or intrusive thoughts that will come to distract you. Metta is a sublime feeling which we need to enhance. It's like you, if you've ever started a fire, you need to eventually, when it's big enough, you need to fan it to give it oxygen. That's what you're doing. But you're not focusing on it too much because where you have a, a tension in the head. That's why we're also applying relaxation. Does it make sense? So I highly recommend you reading the book because it needs to sink in. You need to go over it again and again. I don't, re I don't expect you to get it just because you heard me say these words. You need to apply it. Otherwise, you're just logically understanding something. That's only going to take you so far. Uh, the third one. <laughs> Uh, you don't have to go with Sarakani, you actually can also think of somebody even worse situation. I forgot his name. Other than Angulimala. Uh, <laughs> the king's executioner. He's, his job was to chop off people's heads. That was his profession. If you looked at his resume, he would say, I chop off people's heads for a living. I decapitate people. Before he died, when he's retired, one day Venerable Sariputta is passing by in front of his house and he's with the bull and uh, this retired executioner looks at Venerable Sariputta and says to himself, you know, I've never done anything good. I've taken away people's loved ones, fathers, brothers. And he was served very fine rice, food. Like think of a very fancy biryani or milk rice, something like that. He doesn't touch it. He sees Venerable Sariputta and he, he's filled with joy. He rushes to the door and he hands over the food, the bowl to Venerable Sariputta. He completely puts it inside Venerable Sariputta's bowl and he feels this ecstatic joy. Now, the man had killed countless people. Probably he killed more than Angulimala did. We don't know. It doesn't say in the suttas. Angulimala killed 999. This man had killed for over 50 years, maybe more. So he gets sick. When Busariputta stops by to, I guess he is called over, so he goes to visit him. And the man is very, very, very worried, as anyone would be in his position. He says, Bhante, I'm going to go to hell. 
I know that. And he says, why? He says, because I killed so many people. And Venerable Sariputta asks his mind, remember, this is the thing with many, uh, a, a thing that many translators miss. Many instructors or teachers miss. They remove the characters, the story, and remove them from their context. The human relationship is removed, from, and what's left is the empty, drive, dry words exchanged. That's why when some people ask me, Bhante, how did you translate this? How did you come up with this version? I say to them, I translated, of course, by using the Pali. I've studied, you know, I, I used to be, you know, uh, I have my PhD in Buddhism. So anyhow, I was a scholar. I used the scholarly hat, metaphorically speaking. I also use the understanding of a meditator, the approach of a meditator. Venerable Sariputta was a meditator. He was a bhikkhu. So I approach it like that as well. But thirdly, which often gets missed, is the human element, relational presence, has to be respected. The contextual elements must be respected. In this case, as case in point, Venerable Sariputta is talking to this ex-executioner. He's feeling, he's seeing the agitated mind of this person who's shaking, who's afraid, who's at the moment of death. His last moments of thought, his last moments of feeling are extremely important. That's what's going to dictate where they're going to land after death. Look what Venerable Sariputta says. He says, hmm, when you were killing these people, cutting their heads, was there any hatred in your heart towards them? Did you have any anger? And the man quickly looks and he says, no, not even once. And he says, there you go. There you go. And then he brings his mind back to that act of dana. The man's mind becomes joyful, which is a deva state, heavenly state. At that moment he closes his eyes, and the person is reborn where? Not in hell, in heaven. Now many people have a problem with this. Bante, how can he kill so many people and go to heaven? Well, we didn't say what happens after his time runs out in heaven. There's no record of what happens after in the suttas. However, I hope, <laughs> and here's where I can use that word, hope, that verb, um, he encounters the Dhamma, and that is my wish usually. I don't say, and may he attain Nibbana Supreme after death. That's nonsense. It means nothing. What I do wish when somebody says, oh, Bhante so-and-so died, I say, may he or she in their next rebirth, wherever they're born, may they strongly come in contact with the Dhamma, and may they have the ability, the brain, the birth of a human or a deva, the heart, the willingness, and especially the Sangvega to grab the Dhamma and suck the juice of it and go deep into it like there's no tomorrow and attain the highest. With Venerable Angulimala, if he did not become an Arahant, he was going to face very, very painful birth. That's why Lord Buddha was pushing him to become an Arahant before he died. Because that's when the <coughs> happens to the samsaric link. Because there is no, there's no table for, to, for it to collect dust, if you will. There's no karma. So in this case, this gentleman that I used, so I hope that you can understand in relation to someone who was drunk. Because the last moment is extremely important. 
Not that it doesn't matter, the actions, of course. And he has to be, when we go to a Deva realm, that doesn't mean it's like really heaven, heaven, heaven. Where you go and the mind is bright. You might be a very drunk type of a Deva. You might actually be a very disrespected Deva by the other Devas. You might be called dumb by the other Devas. Most of us think, oh, Deva is like, oh, that's the end of the story. It's perfection. No. No. So my hope is that the Deva would be encountering uh, the Dhamma and really, because there's so many temptations. If you think sensual re uh, attraction is very strong here by you being a young man in a human body, that's nothing compared to you becoming a young Deva where every sensuality, you can multiply it by a million. At least, depending on which level you're on. So it's very tempting for you to be sucked into Adhamma. You can easily be lost. And that's why many, many Devas, when their time is up, they go to hell. Or lower being than a human. Because they never practice and their credit ran, ran, ran out. The credit ran out. Because even as a Deva, you can do a lot of good punya, a lot of good merits. So, I hope that answers your question. This may not be a question, but I hmm. think I have no peace in my mind with this. Um, we all heard that Thailand has legalizing farming of cannabis and I have friends jump into this bandwagon of cultivating and farming cannabis at large and for someone who is a Buddhist and I how could things be so wrong can be so right and one of the biggest precepts has been broken and in some cases there could be temples farming cannabis in the name of science so I was just totally baffling with this idea and how this could be led into the future. So. Simply because Thailand is on paper a Buddhist country doesn't mean that they hold on to Buddhist values. I'm not picking on Thailand, of course. Same thing with, you know, you see it in other Buddhist countries like Sri Lanka. You see other countries, so it's, you know, uh, United States is, it claims itself to be a big proponent of democracy and this and that, big lofty terms, but <laughs> if you live in any part of the world and you are exposed to some news that is unbiased, you see that is all a bunch of hogwash, nonsense. They cause more harm and killing than anybody else. Who was the government, which country actually dropped nuclear bombs? Only one country, for example. So let us not be putting uh, or, or approaching this uh, uh, situations in a way where what you're supposed to be like this, what are you doing? No, you're dealing with people who are not practicing sila. Yes, you have a whole, you know, thousands and thousands of monks there. Buddhist monks means nothing, ultimately, when the government is doing this. They also were responsible for chopping down forests, which the monks needed to practice. There's hardly any forest. You have Thai forest tradition, actually, they live in cities, or they live in very small protected areas that they can call forests. But the forests in the old days, like Ajahn Man's time, they're gone. And it's spreading. The same thing in the Vietnam, the same thing in Burma, everything is spreading. So there's a lot of inequity and a lot of uh, uh, non-virtue. So my encouragement is, you become an island on yourself. That's not my word, that's actually Lord Buddha's. We have to remember the authenticity and the relevancy of those words. Let us not look for the world to be reflecting something in order for us to feel like, yes, okay, so I should be like that too, meaning virtuous. So in, other, in essence, seeing virtue in the world 
so for, I, uh, for me to get inspired enough to become virtuous. No, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. And that's one of the reasons why the Dhamma is going downhill. Because we're looking at the community, the, the society, the country, this group, oh, this group of monks should be really virtuous, so they must be. No, we don't know that. Let me be virtuous first. So that's my encouragement. I don't know if I even gave an answer proper as, as you would like, but unfortunately the cannabis thing is, is happening everywhere and it is, uh, uh, that is a true virus, I call it, because they are dumbing down humanity. 20 years ago I noticed this when I was in uh, teaching secondary schools and I saw how the governments were infiltrating into the school systems, educational systems, and dictating what was going to be taught especially in higher learning, in colleges, post 12th grade, what you're supposed to learn. Critical thinking suddenly disappeared. Critical thinking classes. World history disappeared. Arts disappeared. So what, what are we talking about? Right brain inducing, encouraging uh, themes or courses of, 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 of uh, pedagogy out the window. So now you're preparing humanity to become more and more mecha mechanized, machine-like. And that's why people are becoming more and more apathetic. They don't care. When, I remember when you, you would see somebody being slapped on TV, you would be shocked. A few years ago, some people were sawing somebody's head off. And it was on YouTube. It was even on some news. Yeah, they're putting like, yeah, disclaimer, yeah, you just, well, you know, be aware, we're going to show this. It was on national TV in America. Somewhere in the Middle East, some people were doing that, terrorists. And people were like, yeah, let's switch the channel. Like, yeah, that's, I've seen that. What's happening to humanity? We are losing our humanity. What you're describing should not happen. I've never seen anybody who uses weed or cannabis who did not become dumber and dumber and dumber. In fact, it's a gateway drug. I don't care what other people say. I have seen enough living cases. People in my life as a layperson, I would see people who would do it and they would make arguments. No, 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 this is nothing. I can stop anytime. Meanwhile, they couldn't. And they became, became subhuman. Sacrificed their humanity, their friendships, their sila, all out the window. They did other drugs. This is not a singular example. This is majority of the cases. But there's so much money. Always remember that. As they say, follow the money. <laughs> you will know. You will know. Most of us are always in a confused state. And in this confusion, there is... a. Uh, Avija and Moha, two, two different terms. Maybe Bhante, you would like to kind of give us a little bit more description in terms of this usage of this word Avija, as we know as, as, we know as uh, ignorance, and Moha as delusion. Mm. Uh, because uh, what is Avija in terms of perception, of seeing permanence as impermanence as permanence, and then seeing beauty as uh, repulsive, you know, and then self as non-self. So we kind of understand it in terms of uh, knowledge, but in terms of knowledge, it doesn't come out into realization. So like what the Kalamas were talking to the Buddha hmm. is about so much knowledge from each different sectarian uh, teachers. Like what we face now with so many different religions. So there's no difference between what was and what is. Mm, it is the sense, same. Yes. And impermanence is actually the uh, key which is turning. So maybe if you can yeah, uh, give us a little bit more in depth into these two aspects. Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily say, I, first of all, I appreciate your question. Unfortunately, the time is a factor and uh, Avicca itself, it's... I mean, you can write a dissertation on that. 
and it's not going to be enough. However, what I always try to do, years ago when I was trying to memorize principles and uh, schools of Buddhism and things like that, I realized that I was miserable. I would participate in panel discussions and debates, this and that, and I would come up with very valid arguments and I would walk away victorious, feeling so good about myself that I got them. And I knew my position was, uh, my, my, my conclusions were, Definitive. They were correct according to the, you know, whatever you would read and, and uh, whatever it was there, principle wise, this and that. But they were completely lifeless. Because as I walk away, I was in misery. I had my hang ups, I had my habitual tendencies, I had my anusayas, latent, hidden tendencies, secret intentions that are routinely being kept. So, the reason why I say this is you can intellectualize the Dhamma, and many of us have. That is why I give the example of carrying a menu from a restaurant under your arm and walking away, imagining that you have eaten, your stomach is full. You know and I know you haven't. You're starving. So what do we do? We go to another restaurant and take another menu with us until the whole house is full of menus. This is what we do. And the menu here is a metaphor, of course, for the definition of avijja. The definition of avijja, not just avijja. Because ultimately, yes, there are some subtle nuances between delusion as being moha, of the kileshas and avidya as such. Avidya is avidya in Sanskrit, which is the absence of the knowing and understanding. So it's not necessarily the English word ignorance. The English language, despite being so beautiful in so many ways, is very, very poor when it comes to truly doing justice to the Pali terms. Especially when we see the terms that Lord Buddha used and in his way. Every word that Lord Buddha used, they were completely redone. Kamma, I've given talks on this here. When we talked about, uh, they asked me to give a talk on the similarities and the differences between Buddhism and Jainism. I just gave a snippets of, you know, like Kamma, for example. Many people think, oh, it's Kamma, it's the same thing, right? With Buddhism and Hindus and Jains and no, 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 no. Completely different. So Lord Buddha used the word karma, but he presented it in the including the rebirth in the heavenly realms, the 32, 31 realms of existence. In those days, Brahmins used to believe, to this day, believe that Maha Brahma or Brahma is there, an eternal being. And Lord Buddha says, no, their time will run out. But it's such a vast time period that it looks like it's forever. So, I just would like you to approach the terms avijja and uh, moha in relation to how much suffering they leave behind in their wake, in your life. That to me matters most than what avijja could possibly mean. Because otherwise, when I hear the question, I'm hearing, I'm seeing in my mind the intellect trying to grope in the dark. And that will never be the way to understand the Dhamma. Never. Underline, underscore, bold letters, italics, you name it. It will never work. And I've seen many teachers who push for the cognitive understanding of the Dhamma. That is wrong. That's what we see in the Kalama Sutta. He says, if it's just reason, and I've seen some bhikkhus, some of them I've known them personally, bhantes, that there's many students today of his. They worship what he said about cognition. But it's handicapped 
disabled Dhamma. Because the person does not grow because now they're attached to the images, intellectual understanding of that. So take it into your life. Am I happy by, by this action? Did this leave me in a state of pain or happiness? Check. Check your body. Check your body. If you find your body agitated, there is avijja. Because of avijja, there's dukkha. There's dukkha. Remember, Lord Buddha talked about two arrows that we're shot with when we are born. One is this body. The other is the arrow of ignorance. One of them you can get rid of. The second. With the help of the Dhamma. The other one you will not. So that suffering is not based on avijja. The, first, the, the, the other one is the avijja which causes you to be in cycles of rebirth. That we can remove, that poisonous arrow. But suffering, it's not necessarily, uh, the dukkha itself, it's not necessarily avijja. Physical pain. It becomes so when you have avijja, or specifically in this case. So think of avijja as the ground. And then you have moha. Okay, that's another way of seeing it. It's not the only way. I know the mind wants to say, okay, I'm going to frame this and say, this is the only way that I can... No. This is only another way. And then on top of these, I call moha the mother of the other two. Loba and dosa. Because of moha, you have loba and dosa. Because if you sneak in, if you keep probing and look at the basis of dosa, you will find moha hiding. <laughs> you can smell it. Same thing with loba. Moha is there. That's why you're greedy. So I hope that answers your question. Parts of it. <laughs> yes. Uh, let us uh, transfer some merits. Akasa tachabu matha deva nagama hiddika punyan tanganamo ditwa chirangra kantulo kasasanan. Akasa tachabu matha deva nagama hiddika punyan tanganamo ditwa chirangra kantude sanan. Akasa tachabu matha deva nagama hiddika punyan tanganamo ditwa chirangra kantu mamparanti. Sad, sad.